Miss Yarra, the Mercy. Greetings, heathens. Welcome to Hail Satan. This is the podcast exploring Satanism, culture, and life in general through the eyes of modern Satanists. My name is Joseph Rose. I'm a member of an amazing independent congregation called Satanic Delco, and we welcome members from anywhere in the world. If you want to learn a little bit more about that, visit satanicdelco.com. Today, I'm going to reflect on some observations I've made within Satanic communities, and some of you are going to be upset. But hear me out. Before we get to that, let's acknowledge some rad Satanists that have joined us recently on Patreon. We've got Jenna, Ryan, Tannen, Princess of Blood and Bones, wow, Melanie, Mark, Katie, Chloe, Eric, Ginny, and Alyssa. Thank you, guys. I'm happy to have you join us, and I appreciate your support. Thank you very much. If you've got a moment out there, please visit the website for the podcast at HailSatanPodcast.com. You'll find links to join me on social media, a form to send an email, which I encourage you to do, and a link to join up with us on Patreon. We have a few different tiers to choose from there with various benefits, including the amazing Greetings from Hell Satanic Postcard of the Month Club. That is the most direct way you can support me in this show. If you'd like to do that, visit HailSatanPodcast.com. Okay, this episode is in part a reaction to my most recent episode with Shane Bugby, or more accurately, it's a reaction to the reaction to that episode. But that isn't really the story. This is much bigger than that, and it's definitely not new or specific to my podcast. But let's start there. Let's start with that interview with Shane Bugby. I put the episode out there, and as usual, I see feedback on it in many forms. Some emails come in, messages on social media, some chats in the Satanic Delco group, and the usual online forums where people discuss this stuff. As usual, feedback is mixed. By far, most of it is always very nice and complimentary and generally supportive, which is really nice, of course. But that's the easy part. I've been a creative person with lots of different projects for essentially my entire life thus far. So I know all about how people in my position shouldn't waste their time looking at or engaging with haters on the internet. It's generally a fruitless waste of time, and as we all know, even the greatest works of art have people who dismiss, criticize, and put them down. Hell, if you dig around long enough, you'll find a person out there who thinks Master of Puppets isn't the greatest heavy metal album of all time. But even for something as obvious as that, it still falls under subjectivity. But most of the time, negative feedback is pretty easy too. Good, bad, like it, don't like it, who cares? I've never attempted to create a single thing that I thought would please everyone. It's honestly never even crossed my mind during the creation of anything I've ever done. What can I do, or make, or say that will please the greatest amount of people? I don't know about you guys. I'm sure there are plenty of creators out there listening. But that's just not part of the process for me. And let's be real. Not all negative feedback is genuine. Some of it is. Some of it is really smart and articulate and helpful. But realistically... Some people view you as competition, so they want to bring you down. Some people have a personal grudge and want to see you fail. Some people just have empty, unsatisfying lives, and they need to bring others down. But despite all of that, 
sometimes I do look. And sometimes I will engage in a limited fashion, more or less, depending on my mood or how effectively I'm avoiding work at that moment. And I do it because, are you ready for this? This is crazy, I know. I do it because I think it's really important to expose yourself to opposing viewpoints and critical feedback. In fact, I know it's really important to expose yourself to opposing viewpoints and critical feedback. I know you're surely sitting there thinking, why, Father Joseph, is it so important? After all, I am an ordained minister of Satan, so I'm going to tell you. I have three primary reasons. They are, number one, learn about the landscape. Two, learn about the opposition. And three, learn about yourself. Learn about the landscape just means you get a baseline understanding of where you fit within a certain culture or community. This one is probably most important in the early days of a project for me, but it's always moving and changing. You see what types of people gravitate toward you or your creation and why they do. You see which types of people push against it and why. And you also see who completely ignores it. A simple example. I had a band that I played in for years. We were a quirky sort of heavy rock band, but we had a bunch of electronic and noisy elements along with the heavy guitars. We didn't know exactly what it was or what label to put on it, but promoters would always book us with these gothy industrial type bands. We didn't really like those bands, and we felt that we had almost nothing in common with them, but yet that crowd seemed to like us. Once that pattern was established, we had a better sense of our place in our scene at that time, and knowing that was helpful. Number two is learn about the opposition. If you're looking for or engaging with opposing viewpoints, obviously you have to learn what those viewpoints are first. You have to listen to them and absorb them properly. Give it a moment to sink in. But the viewpoints themselves, while potentially important or valuable, are not the whole story. Empathy is key here. Empathy is defined as the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. It's important to understand the reasons why you or your creation is having the specific impact that it's having. When you share opinions on things like I do on here, naturally some people will disagree. And depending on what the topic is, it might be something that people take very seriously or personally. They might feel offended in some cases. For example, we talk about the Satanic Temple a lot. As we all know, they are the big, unavoidable Walmart of modern Satanism, so of course they're going to be talked about. And as we've discussed, TST attracts a lot of brand loyalists looking for something to hang their identity on, as well as people interested in left-leaning political activism. And I hope people don't get the wrong idea about that. That isn't an insult or anything inherently negative. But for many of those people, it's personal. When you express a dissenting opinion related to the Satanic Temple, these folks immediately make you the opposition. It doesn't matter what the message is or how true it may be. The mission becomes essentially to burn the witch. Silence them, ban them, shut them down. Of course, this isn't everyone. There are tons of really lovely, smart, reasonable people on the Satanic Temple's membership list. I share a congregation with many of them, and I suspect a majority of people listening to this podcast are members of TST. But there are more than enough of these folks to warrant the discussion. There are various reasons for those behaviors, but one is easy to explain. It is simply the context of religion in one's life. 
Many people come to Satanism after a history with other religions that didn't work for them or were in some cases traumatizing. When they find the Satanic Temple, it's like they've found salvation. They latch on really tight. It's like that uh, rebound relationship after they break up with their shitty fiancé. And when you oppose the organization or even specific parts of it in some way, they feel it's an attack on their religion, which is a fundamental part of themselves. They react defensively without any hint of objectivity. And identifying those people or groups for what they are is really important. They out themselves as a group that doesn't need to be taken seriously. Trying to convince those people that the Satanic Temple isn't their perfect savior is like trying to convince your Catholic grandma that God isn't real. It's probably a waste of time. Now, it's also very important to remember that while those people exist and are plentiful, they do not represent all of your detractors or opposition. To simply write off your opposition under the assumption that they're all just brainwashed or stupid or immoral would be a terrible oversight. It's in our nature to believe that we are not only right, but also inherently good. Who amongst us actually thinks they're a bad person? I can't say for sure, but probably not very many at all. I think we all make the choices we make or believe the things we believe because we think they're right and good. And of course, the people who oppose you feel the same way about themselves. Having an understanding of who those people are, where they come from, and what life experiences have shaped their views and reactions comes through empathy, and it is invaluable. And then there is number three, learn about yourself. This is perhaps the most important if I had to prioritize them. And I say that simply because long after these moments in time have come and gone, we're left with ourselves. If some part of one's personal philosophy involves the general idea of self-improvement, then of course, this is of the utmost importance. In the context of interacting with opposing viewpoints, this is how you strengthen your argument. This is how you solidify and support your viewpoint. Again, using the example of a content creator, significant effort is spent before a work is shared with the world. Something like an album, a podcast, a work of art or expression of any kind. So by the time it reaches the masses, a sincere creator already believes in the work. Research has been done. Skills have been honed. Questions have been asked and answered already. But the critics out there will be waiting. They're waiting to poke holes in your every idea. Some are salivating in anticipation to deliver that virtue-signaling death blow in a Twitter reply or a Reddit comment. Of course, this has more to do with them and far less to do with the creation itself, but that doesn't mean we can't use it to our advantage. Combined with empathy, we have to use reasonable judgment to decide how much weight or attention is deserved by any specific source of opposition. Is it some jealous hater hiding behind anonymity on a website? Or is it someone bringing forward a legitimate, articulate challenge or question? And when it is a legitimate challenge, the natural motivation, for me at least, is to go dig a little deeper. To go back and double check. Make sure I got that part right. Make sure that I said what I meant and meant what I said. To make sure I'm getting the facts straight and, if necessary, respond with additional clarity or detail. In many situations, you'll find that being forced to defend your case is how you strengthen your case. You may find that your opposition opens your eyes to a perspective that you hadn't considered or weren't really able to consider based on your own 
limited knowledge and life experiences. And when that happens, you're better for it. And that improvement simply wouldn't have been possible without first exposing yourself to those opposing viewpoints. And as a bonus, reason number four, sometimes I'm just in the mood to argue on the internet. That's just all there is to it. If there's no one good to argue with on the internet, I'll just call Jerry, and he's bound to say something crazy for us to argue about, which I love. In summary here, don't stay in a bubble. Don't be afraid to gain knowledge from and face a challenge from the other side. But all that still isn't getting directly at the problem. I think I mentioned earlier there is, in fact, a problem. I'm finding that far too many, in quotes, Satanists, are dragging deeply unsatanic behaviors into satanic communities. I said I would use the example of my interview with Shane Bugby, so let's do that. But make no mistake, this stuff is not limited to me or my podcast. As I described, I put the episode out, and the feedback came in from every which way, as usual. I got a bunch of nice email and comments on the episode. But here are a few quotes from people presenting as the opposition. First one. Shane Bugby is a fascist, white supremacist who did not deserve a platform. Next, we've got the fact that you gave this man a platform is beyond shocking. And the next one says the guy's a conservative who consistently features far right personalities on his platform. (laughs) That's me calling me a conservative. In addition to those. I was actually called racist for platforming Shane. There's just so much here. And normally I would just laugh this stuff off. What is there to even take seriously, really? One person obviously has no idea what fascism even is. Another person is clutching their rosaries about how beyond shocking it is that I would speak to Shane Bugby. And one of them just flat out lies and says, I consistently feature far right personalities on my show. If you listen to this show regularly, you know, I've never had even one far right personality on here. And this is a pretty common tactic. People will make a vague claim of impropriety without presenting any evidence whatsoever in the hopes that enough gullible people will just believe it, jump on the outrage train, and go along with it. And unfortunately for society, far too many people do. This reminds me of what's come to be known as Hitchens' Razor. It's one of my favorite quotes from the late Christopher Hitchens. He wrote, What can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence. And then, of course, there's the genius who says I'm actually a racist because apparently the definition of racist is a person who has Shane Bugby on their podcast. Again, normally you just ignore or laugh off nonsense like this. But in this case, I only bother to mention it because these are people that identify on some level as Satanists. I know that seems ridiculous, but it's actually becoming more and more common to find these types in communities of TST-flavored Satanists, people that are anti-free speech, the desperate virtue signaling, the whole feigning outrage cancel culture type bullshit. And you'll see plenty of bullying in general of those who step outside of some invisible moving target of... I don't even know what, political correctness or something. Back on my episode called The Freedom to Offend, I mentioned that there is a sizable portion of TST's membership who don't actually agree with the fourth tenet as it's intended. I suspect these types that I've been talking about today heavily overlap with those people who don't align with the fourth tenet. 
In the midst of all the chatter about this, one commenter said, I think communication with those that are our opposites is the best way to a better tomorrow. Standing in a circle of people that agree with you would get dull and move no mountains. And I agree with him. How is this even still up for debate? Just to catch everyone up on the basics here, Shane Bugby said a bunch of unfavorable things alongside Lucian Greaves many years ago. And around that same time, he had republished an unfavorable book featuring illustrations by Lucian Greaves. To refresh everyone's memory, I have just a couple of clips of my interview with Shane. So let's give a listen. About... 2015 or 14, I started to move away from that stuff. I started to get therapy. And when I was treating my traumas, I was able to see other people's traumas for the first time. Because before that, I could only think about my problems until I, you know, I was able to deal with those, you know, that anxiety and stuff. Then I was able to see like uh, people of color's issues, you know, like how, how bad they have it. If I have it this hard, if I'm that fucking bad, oh man, you really got it. And so I was able to start seeing that stuff. And at that point, I really started to pull away and say, we have to do something about what we created here. It's, it's, there's a groundswell happening that I'm responsible for ultimately. Uh, the people I worked with were tools. They did what I said. And so I need to figure out something about this. And then 2016 hit, I got a bunch of emails from like Trump fans and white supremacist people and thanking me for putting out might is right. And our, our president's in, in the office and oh fuck. And that's when I took it off sale. I was like, yeah, you know, I can't even, I can't even take money for this thing anymore. And just one more clip of Shane here. Around how old were you when Might is Right was uh, republished? Mid-20s. Mid-20s. I can't, you know, it's so long ago for me, you know, I'm in my 50s now. Yeah. And I don't, I don't really feel like I'm in my 50s, but sometimes, you know, memory and something like, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, But a long time ago, almost three decades ago. I just asked because I wonder how much of your connection and interest and everything that you had toward that book at that time is a big product of not only your environment and experiences, but the fact that you were a young man, you know, you were, um, how much of it was just the edgy, rebellious sort of bit of a young man? I think when you see people like angry white males or people like myself or just angry men, you know, or angry people. I'm sorry to keep making it as men, but um, like people that storm the Capitol, let's say those people are carrying their parents issues. I was carrying my pa- my father's rage. I wasn't even defined as a human being at that point. I was still carrying my father's rage, but I could see what he was saying as far as the working class getting stuck. And he was a union member. So when I was talking about might is right and shit like that, always in my head and heart was my father as a pipe fitter, a union member, picket lines in Chicago, how picket lines people would have. when I was a child, you'd see picket lines, union members with ball bats, and they'll beat the shit out of you. If you cross the picket line, like you're not going to get groceries, we'll fuck you up. And so that's how I saw this might is right challenge. Like the Teamsters union shows might in order to get what they want. It doesn't take any tremendous effort to empathize with the person in those clips. It shouldn't be hard to consider the trauma a person may have endured early in life that results in the kind of anger and bitterness that pushes some towards things like might is right. And despite that trauma, the man has chosen to put himself in therapy through which he's been able to understand the trauma of others. He also happens to entrust a black man with his mental health, if that matters to anyone. And as he mentioned in the clip, he willingly removed the book from sale, sacrificing his own ability to profit from it. And guys, keep in mind, I don't know Shane. I've had one real conversation with him, and you all heard it. It's not like I'm defending him because he's a close personal friend of mine. He isn't. If Shane Bugby is a racist, fuck Shane. That's my official stance. But I'm absolutely not prepared to sit here acting like some virtuous judge, jury, and executioner for any Satanist with a checkered past. I got news for you kids. There's a fucking ton of Satanists with a checkered past. 
there's not a lot of people that end up in Satanism without one. And not that it matters, but do I agree with everything Shane says? Absolutely not. Do his views represent my views? No. He's a flawed, wild, fallible human being. And looking at him through a lens of compassion, because I'm a fucking Satanist, I see a far from perfect man who has evolved and continues to evolve in a direction that I view as positive. And I don't need you to agree. I sure as hell don't need you to like Shane Bugby. But if you're a Satanist who's elevated yourself to the position of a moral judge of things like who deserves a platform or not, you've fallen way off the fucking path. You need to look in the mirror and turn that judgment inward. You should be doing the kind of introspection and work that Shane seems to be doing. You're being insincere, judgmental bullies, and it's not nice. As a Satanist with big picture views that I suspect align primarily but not exclusively toward the left side of the political spectrum, I think there's an assumption by many that I should agree with these folks on everything and play by all of the rules that they make up. And obviously, as a Satanist, my response to that is, bitch, please. I'd hate to see these types of people water down many of the traits that we've appreciated and associated with Satanism for so long now. Empathy for the outsider. Free thought. A rebellion against tyranny, not a recreation of tyranny. Let's just get it together, guys. Let's crank up the acceptance a bit and aim that saltiness toward the people who are working against all Satanists. I know this one was a little on the shorter side today, but this is what I had on my mind for you. So if you've got a minute, please visit the website at HailSatanPodcast.com. I'd like you to stay safe out there and don't take any shit from the bullies. Hail Satan. Shit in it. He will free his service.